Great. Thank you, Aaron. Welcome, everyone. I always like to start by telling people how I got into this business working with older adults. I was 25 years into a 35-year career in financial services and with my sisters moved my mom to assisted living. It was an amazing experience for lots of reasons. You know, she left a home after 40 years. It was a very difficult time for her. Um, and when I was able to work with her in the community, I did a lot of volunteer work and was so energized by older adults and the stories that they told. And I said, when I'm 55 and I'm able to retire, I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna do something in this space. I had no idea what it was gonna be. Um, and I stumbled across Senior Move Management six years ago and haven't, uh, and haven't turned back. So it's really been an amazing journey and it's an amazing journey because I get to meet so many people, hear incredible stories, and you'll be amazed at the amount of stories that I get just by going through people's stuff, right? And we're gonna talk about that today. As Aaron said, um, we are the Dovetail, uh, Dovetail Companies and our leadership team includes Aaron and her co-owner, Lauren Watts. I head up director, uh, the Move Management team as the Director of Move Management, and Julie Ford is our Director of Home Sales. As Aaron dis discussed in the first presentation, this is kind of sensitive. Uh, in the first presentation, we really are really the best of three worlds combined, assisting older adults in planning what their next steps can be, and their next step can be moving to a smaller home, a condo, can be going to a retirement community, aging in place, how do I do that? Uh, how do I make room for um, all of, uh, make room so I can age in place? Um, right sizing and moving, Claire and team work with our clients in dealing with all the belongings. And we'll talk about how that can be overwhelming and how sometimes a third party can be really helpful. And then finally, working with our clients in selling their homes. How many people have heard the term downsizing? Uh, it is, in our view, it has such a negative connotation. And it, it just by virtue of having down as the, as the first syllable, right? I think that um, we've heard so much about it in the last 15, 20 years, and it's, this is what you need to do. You need to have two of those and one of those, and maybe you know only five of those. And we know that it's not true. There's not, you can't have a prescribed method for how you're going to manage the contents of your home. So we like to call it right sizing because right sizing means it's right for you. What is right for you may not be right for the person sitting next to you. And I'll give you an example of that. My 84 year old godmother um, decided that she was gonna age in place. So she redid her entire kitchen. So we packed up her kitchen. And then when the kitchen was done, we were unpacking the kitchen. And Judy is a baker, so she loves to bake. And as we're unpacking, she had four sets of measuring cups. And I said, Judy, do you need four sets of measuring cups? She said, yes, because if, I, if I've just measured Crisco, I'm not cleaning out that cup because I have to measure flour. And I said, all right, I, I got it, I got it. And we always say, if there's room for it and it's safe, you keep it. Or if you're moving, you take it with you. If we had gone, taken that prescribed method of you need one set of measuring cups, you need one spatula, whatever that is, it would not have brought Judy joy, right? She would not have been able to do what she really wants. So we really look at this as a process by which you end up with the amount of things or the contents in your home that really makes sense to you. Right sizing isn't a one and done thing. You don't go through the process once and never have to do it again. It's an ongoing journey, right? It's a constant review of your contents. And we'll talk a little bit about you know, how you can do that. And it's an ongoing journey because you've collected things because you've lived a good life. That's the good news, right? You're gonna continue to live a good life after you've right-sized. You're gonna continue to collect the things that you have been collecting. We're gonna talk about where it came from and sometimes it's surprising when we really sit down and look at all of our, the contents in our home and say, where did all that stuff come from, 
right? Did it come from other people? Did it come, be, come because I had a bad habit and I just collected things? Whatever that is, and we'll talk about that as well. Common question, why is it still in the house? 90% of the time, it's I have no idea. Either I have no idea or I just, I don't, I haven't thought about it. And then we'll talk about a specific situation where I encountered that in my move recently. And then finally, how do I get started? Clients always want to know, all right, that's great. You've just told me all this great stuff, but how do I get started? How do I know what I need? Oop. So where did it all come from? Monumental life events. At birthdays, you celebrated anniversaries, you, weren't, you worked, you had a career, you got awards, you wrote white papers, you did all kinds of things that resulted in something that you kept. You've stayed current. And an example of this is, you know, to sort of freshen up your room, you say, I'm going to buy a couple of new pillows for the sofa. So you go out and buy a couple of new pillows, you take the old pillows, and you throw them on the top of the closet shelf or the bottom of the closet, you don't deal with them. So we just, we stay current, right? I'm gonna talk about how I stayed current with paint and it came back to bite me. You can stay current and you wanna stay current, right? You're gonna right size now, you may get new pillows now for the living room. A Couple of years from now, you're gonna say, oh, I'm tired of those. You're gonna get new pillows, right? You're staying current, you're still living. How do you deal with the old ones? We've had hobbies. We've had hobbies that we've taken up since we've retired. We've had hobbies that we took up 15, 20 years ago that we haven't touched. And what comes with that is a ton of supplies, right? And then a ton of stained glass. We have wood carvings. We have crocheted more um, doilies than we ever could use or anyone wants. So our hobbies have sort of resulted in us collecting a lot of things. The store, we go to the store sometimes absolutely thoughtless, right? We walk up and down the aisle sometimes, it catches your eye, you grab it. That's fine, but if you pick up, good example, can opener. I did it a couple weeks ago, picked up a new can opener because the can opener I was using for the dog's food was really tough in my hands. I put that can opener, in the new can opener in the drawer. I never got, <laughs> never got rid of the old one. I had to eventually. A couple of days later, I was like, why do I still have that? And threw it away. Sort of practice what you preach. And then finally, it's from someone else's right-sizing efforts. Oh, mom, she has that basement. I'm going to put it in her basement. Or, I know, my brother Bill, he wants that desk. I'm going to save him that desk. We end up with a bunch of stuff we don't want. The beauty of right-sizing, once you've done it, you have the right to say, you know something, I have cleared out everything. I don't have the space in my head, may have it in my basement, but I don't have the space anymore to take things that I don't need, that don't serve me. It was easier 10, 15, 20 years ago to say, yeah, okay, I'll take that, it's fine, put it in the basement. Or how do you say no when Aunt Helen's Governor Winthrop desk comes you know, at your door? Me. So when I say it will, you'll continue to live, I say that you are going to continue to collect things. You're going to continue to have monumental life events. You're going to continue to celebrate life's greatest moments, right? You're going to continue to stay, comfort, stay current with new pillows. You're going to continue to have hobbies, new hobbies, right? And you're going to continue to go to the store. It's just being more thoughtful about how you approach those things that you acquire so you're not left in that same position. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. So when I said staying current kind of kicked me in the butt, this is what I mean. I moved a year and a half ago from a home I was in for 22 years. And the first thing I did is um, sort of think about how I was going to approach it. So I thought, oh, I have so much, there's so much in the basement, whatever. And I've been doing these presentations for so long, and I always talk about paint. Paint is one of those things. It's really easy to deal with because there's no emotional attachment to a can of paint in the basement. So get rid of it, and it'll give you momentum to keep going. So I went to the basement, and this is the result, not even just a snapshot, of all the paint that I had in the basement. So, I guess, like as I said, we were in this house for 22 years. 
I stayed current. I stayed current in the bathroom with this color, this color, and you can see a little bit of that color. I kept it because I was going to have scuff marks on the wall that I'd have to cover up. When I replaced this color with this color, why didn't I just get rid of this color? <laughs> I didn't, so I collected things. The thing really interesting is that this navy blue was the color of the bathroom of the house we were in before I moved 22 years ago. <laughs> so I paid a mover to move a can of paint that I had to deal with tw like 26 years 26 years later. So it was in the house because it really was out of sight, out of mind until I was reminded about it when I was talking to clients about paint has no value, it's a good place to start. And then it hit me, now it's in my mind, I have that to deal with and I did. It represents something. We have something in our house that's, or something that someone has given us that really means a lot to us. And I say, again, if it's safe and you have space for it, keep it. Sometimes that could be photographs, it can be books, and you really have to spend the time, you know, giving reverence and to, the, to that specific item and then moving on, right? Saying, I have really enjoyed this, I have loved it. Is there someone, does someone else want it? And if no one else wants it, finding a new home for it. If it's a bunch of photographs, how do you recycle them? You're saving it for someone, right? I know that my daughter wants that china. Your daughter doesn't want your china, right? So you go through that process. If you go through this right-sizing process and you end up having done so much clearing in the basement and the attic and the guest room and the closet, but you keep holding this small table in the guest room because you know your nephew Joe wants that table, you finish all this work, you say to Joe, I have this table, look, I've saved it for you. Which I was like, I don't want that table. How defeating and deflating is that, right? To have done that and make that assumption. We did a clear out of a really beautiful home. Um, uh, and I worked with the son of a woman who had gone to assisted living. And he was doing it for, he had two siblings, both of, which, both of whom were out of state. And this home was beautiful. And the best way I can describe it is, she had white silk upholstered furniture in the living room, and regardless of whether it needed to be reupholstered or not, for the time they lived in that house, she had it reupholstered every five years. That was the kind of person she was and the things that she collected. Waterford, yard rows, beautiful carpets, paintings, lamps, beautiful furniture. So we go through the house, and what we do is we, you know, if a, if a client doesn't necessarily want things. We work for donation, but he also, we also find buyers to, to buy items. So we're going through the house. We're putting things in the basement, and the son says to me, oh, that box over there in the corner is mine. So, you know, please don't let that go to donation. And I looked at it, and in the box was this big gold plaster of Paris eagle and some hangers and a Bodum coffee press. That was it. And I said, John, do you mind me asking why those items? And he said, well, I need the hangers and I don't have a coffee press. I said, but why the eagle? And he said, that eagle hung in our family room on that fireplace for my entire life. And every picture we have as a family, we're, we're standing under that eagle. He said, my wife will not let me put it up in our apartment. They lived in the city. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I can't bear to get rid of it. And I said, do you think that if you asked your mother five years ago, what is John going to want out of this house? Do you think she would have said some uh, velvet hangers, the eagle, and a bottom coffee press? He said, no. She thinks I, we all want everything. We want the sets of Vilroy and Bach china she had for every single season. We want all her Waterford. We want all her furniture, all of that. The good news is that we were able to sell a lot of her a lot of her items, but not assuming that someone wants something will give you so much, it give you a lot of pleasure in knowing that you didn't go through the process for nothing. But it's also great to say, as you go through this process, to say to folks, to your family, to your friends, I'm, go, I'm trying to thin out everything that I have, or I'm trying to thin out what I have in this bedroom or whatever it is. Do you want anything? you may be surprised as to what people will want. We see clients all the time when we go through this process 
especially if they're moving and they have a large kitchen island they'll, or a dining room table, they'll fill it with all the stuff they want to get rid of. And when people come to visit, they say, if you want it, please take whatever, and then they donate the rest. So it's always great then to see what someone picks and ask them, why, why do you want that? And the memory that's attached to something is really paying good you know, reverence to it and makes you feel good about um, getting rid of it. One client said to me once, when I've asked all of my children if they want something and they say they don't, I feel totally fine getting rid of it. Because I know if it's not in their hearts, it's not in mine. And I thought that was the best advice. If my family doesn't want it, my kids don't want it, it really has no value, it has no emotional value to me. And I thought that was really great. And then finally, it's still in the house because we have no clue. It's just there, right? Help if I had glasses on. There we go. So clients say, how do I begin? How do I get started? And I say, don't attempt to boil the ocean. Has anyone ever heard that expression? You try to boil the ocean, you're never going to get it boiled. right? You're ne if you, you could never get it boiled. And I find that akin to going to the bottom of the basement stairs, and the ocean is the basement. If you try to attack the basement and say, I'm going to clear out this basement today or this week, you're going to be overwhelmed. So don't try to do the entire basement. Take it in really manageable bites, one bite at a time. And we'll talk about dealing with an entire inventory of a thing as opposed to dealing with an entire room. It may be emotional. And I keep meaning to change it because it's not, it not may be emotional, it will be emotional. You will feel emotion about something. You'll be, feel emotional about, you may not be attached to the specific thing that you're getting rid of, but you may think of that as, ah, oh, remember when I used to use these. So it's going to be, an emo it's going to be emotional. So I, you need to recognize that going in. And it's always going to be hard work. It's always going to be work lifting and moving and thinking about what I want to keep and what I don't want to keep. You want to think about how can I support how I live my life now and how I want to live my life after I go through getting rid of stuff. And you could be doing it because you're just wanting to be more comfortable in your home. You want to turn a, a, a den downstairs into a first floor master bedroom, whatever reason it is, or whether you, move, uh, you are moving, whatever the reason is, think about how am I going to live my life once I've gone through the process? Don't get rid of the things that really mean something to you. If they're safe, if they're comfortable, they stay, and you have room for them. And finally, as I said, it's a lot of work. So ask for help. And asking for help, you'll, you'll be surprised of uh, how many of your family and friends will want to help, right? Sometimes it, you're going to be very particular about who they are because you know the ones that are going to tell you to get rid of it versus, you know, those people who are going to really sit with you and pay reverence to the, to the specific item. So once all of that is done, so once you sort of start and you think about an inventory of items, I'm going to take it one small step at a time, um, and I'm going to be methodical about it and think about it and recognize that there's going to be emotion, how do I deal with it in a sort of systematic kind of way? We call this the emotional and functional scale. You deal with things that are emotional near the end of the process. If it has absolutely no emotion attached to it, paint cans, if we, and I always say, if we have emotions attached to pain cans, we probably should all be in a different room. So deal with the things that have no emotion attached to them. And when they have no emotion attached to them, and you've made progress, and you've emptied out a closet, or you've emptied out that, contain, that shelving of paint, you get some fuel to move ahead and move forward. If you had started with photos, if photos mean a lot to you, you would go down a hole and you would, you would be I can't do this. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible for me to do it. And then when clients finally get there and they still say, I can't do it, we say, this is what we can do. 
Let's take all of the photos out of those thick albums and let's just put them in some plastic containers so that at some point you can go through them. They'll be taking up less space, but they will also, you will also have made some progress and made up some, um, some do you need something? So and we say with people that are moving all the time, we say, don't worry about dealing with the photos. We'll take them all out of the albums. You know, and, and sometimes, remember when we'd go to CVS and we'd get our film developed, we'd have to wait for it. Even if there was a thumb on the print, we put it in the album. We go through the process. We take out the ones that don't mean anything. And even in the process, we end up thinning them out. But we go from a stack of photo albums that's like that to a very small, you know, tw- 8 by 12 plastic container. So even if you can't deal with photos, we have a way that you can sort of deal with photos. From a functional perspective, we want to say, what do I want to, what do I need to continue living my life the way I like to live my life? And this is an example of someone who's moving to a smaller space. So someone is moving to a condo that doesn't have a huge dining room. They're not moving for four months. You love to entertain every Saturday night. Are you going to get rid of that dining room set now, or are you going to wait until three and a half months from now? So think about what it is that you still need. You have guest rooms that have bed linens, that need bed linens, and you know that you're gonna have guests in the next three months, right? Don't get rid of all your guests, don't get rid of all of your bed linens now. Get rid of them when you don't need them. Because people end up then thinking, oh, I need those, I need those, I need those linens because I'm gonna have guests, I need that table because I'm gonna entertain, and then they just don't do anything. Deal with the stuff that you know right now you don't need and you don't use. And then finally, when you get to a place and you're going to move to a space and you're only going to have a primary bedroom and maybe a pull-out sofa and a den, you then need just the linens for your primary bedroom. You can then get rid of the linens at that point, right? And then dining room table, we see what all the time when we, get, we move clients to smaller spaces. They love their dining room set. Yeah, you can take the dining room set, but you're probably not going to be able to use three leaves like you used to or two. So we take the table and four chairs. We take the buffet or the bottom of the china cabinet and put it under a wall-mounted TV in the living room. So thinking about, don't get rid of those things. If you had gotten rid of the dining room set and you then end up at a place where a new dining room, and then you say, oh, I have no place for my TV. I have no sort of entertainment center that has, gives me extra storage. Uh, then at that point, you're, you've already gotten rid of it. <laughs> and you have to go out and buy something else. Buy, buy, some, buy something else when you can repurpose things. So it's really giving thought to how do I use my space now and how will I use my new space? It happens all the time where we see clients that want to age in place, have dining rooms that don't get used, and they turn their dining room into a primary bedroom, right? That's a lot of great primary bedroom furniture. And we will say, let's take that base of the china cabinet or the buffet and let's use that in your den now because it's going to give you some more storage. And you, or you can still keep everything that you had in it. Right? If we thought about, I had to clear out that dining room because I'm going to turn it into a master bedroom, you then end up with, I have to deal with all the contents of that china cabinet now, when you really, in fact, could have kept it and used it for something else. This is the story of Mary and Bill and how you can apply the 80-20 rule to dealing with your things. So we say, this is how you get started. You get started with things that have no emotion, and things that you don't need right now. But then how much of those things do I need, right? So as a good example, we say apply the 80-20 rule, meaning that 80% of the time we use 20% of what we have. Mary's sweaters. We go into Mary's closet and Mary has 35, 40, 50. We've seen hundreds of sweaters. And we say, all right, let's get started. And by dealing with the inventory of sweaters, and because Mary has so many sweaters, Mary has sweaters in the primary bedroom. She has them in um, some bins in the attic, holiday sweaters. She has sweaters in the guest bedroom closet. Mary fills up every place she can because she loves sweaters or slacks or blouses, whatever that is. And Bill's just as guilty. We'll get to him. So we say to Mary, let's get all of your sweaters. 
don't put, try to boil the ocean that is the primary bedroom closet. And they say, I'm going to do all of that. So if Mary takes out the 10 sweaters she has in the primary bedroom closet, she's given no regard for all those sweaters that she has in every other part of the house. Right? If she does it, that just for, you know, and then she gets down, she gets three more sweaters because she's viewing that inventory as I only have 10 and I have to get rid of some. If those 10 are in her primary bedroom closet, those are the 10 that she probably uses the most. So she can't bear to get rid of any of those. But when you get them all together, we count them out and we say, all right, take out 60 sweaters, she has 60. We say, take out 20 sweaters that you really, really want to keep. She'll go to those, the first 20 that she'll, the first that she'll take out of the 20 are the ones that came out of the primary bedroom closet because those are the ones she uses often. And then she'll say, and I'll say, I'm going to take five more or take, you know, 10 more. How about this one? No, I don't need that. How about that one? And then you notice she has, you know, black sweaters, 15 black sweaters. All right, Mary, let's take a look at your 15 black sweaters. How many of those, how many of these do you really need? So we've dealt with the inventory within the inventory, right? The inventory of sweaters and then the inventory of the black sweaters. So Mary then ends up, she may have 60 total sweaters at the end, She's not down to, you know, 20% of what she had, but she could be down to 40, 30. How much room does 20 or 30 sweaters take up, right? So by taking it in an, in, in, you know, inventory by inventory, she has then made space in the primary bedroom closet, the attic where she does the storage in the rubber made tubs, the primary, uh, the, sorry, the guest room closet. She's made progress in each one of those places. Had she just attacked the bedroom and the master, be- the master bedroom closet, she would not have made as much progress. Bill's golf shorts, and this is a real example. So Bill's getting pressure from Mary to clean out those golf shirts. You don't need all those golf shirts. Well, Mary doesn't need all those sweaters, and Bill doesn't say that to her. But Bill has all those golf shirts for a very specific reason. So I worked with this client and he did have a lot of golf shirts and they were all on hangers every one of them and i said what are the you know i said let's pull them out let's count them let's take what are the what the golf shirts that you wear pretty regularly they were the ones that were right in front of the closet and then we looked at some i said i looked at the size they were extra large and then i said just don't, extra large is the most comfortable. Yes, it is. It's the most comfortable. I said, do you feel comfortable? Let's get rid of Let's see if there's any larges in here that you don't wear anymore. Go through. We got large and large. Collect all those. Oh, well, yeah, I don't need those. I don't wear those. We get to this, what looks like a, it's faded on the, the shoulders from the hanger. It looks like it's 100 years old. And I said, what about this one? He goes, no, I'm not. That, that, let me tell you the story about that one. That was a shirt that he had when he had his first hole in one, <laughs> right? So he was not getting rid of that shirt. Do you think that Mary wanted to hear that story again? You know? So we went through that. We paid. He was like, yeah, I guess I don't, I don't, I don't need it. I said, you have room. You can, still, you can still take it. You have reduced your closet from this many to this many. You can keep that. And he was totally fine giving it away, like getting rid of it and recycling for textiles. So again, if if we talk about third party coming in and helping a family or a friend, a spouse is always going to be tougher on you than a a third party will be, right? Because they may have heard the story. They may be feeling a lot of this, you know, the same emotions that you are about the process, right? All Bill wants to do is talk about his golf shirts. All Mary wants to do is talk about those beautiful holiday sweaters that she wears every day from November 1st to January 15th, right? So Bill doesn't want to hear that. So sometimes having a third party go through this process is really helpful. Mary and Bill's kitchenware, not the same couple, but Mary and Bill are going to be used as the example. And this is the false graph china. This is the kind of china that they had. Everyone remember that from like the 80s and 90s? So this couple had every piece of this china that you can imagine. Plates, salad plates, dessert plates, soup crocks, soup bowls, cups, mugs, saucers, salt and pepper shakers, um, 
carafes, casserole, that they had every piece that you can imagine. And I said, well, you've been collecting it for a long time. <laughs> the wife said, no, I get, I've been getting this for my, I got this for Christmas, my birthday, anniversary, for the last 40 years. <laughs> she had so much of this stuff, it was, I've never seen it, it was crazy. And I keep meaning, I want to go to, um, like to thrift store and buy just one piece so I have it as a prop to show you. But every time I go, they try to sell the whole thing. I'm not going to buy a whole set of it, but that is exactly what they had. So I said, let's get it down to what it is that you need. And um, this was a, cl a client that was moving to a smaller space. And <clears throat> I said, you need max six dinner plates. And when I had looked, there were stacks of dinner plates like that. And I said, let's take six dinner plates. So I took the dinner plates down and I went to the bottom of the pile and got six. The six on the bottom, not a knife mark on them because they kept using the same ones and putting them back. So we got them down to six, six plates. We donated the salt and pepper shakers, the butter dish, the crock pot, all of the things, the casserole dishes, all the other things. And we got to the mugs and the cups and saucers. I don't know if you know this pattern. It has a really odd-looking coffee cup. It's really big and wide, um, but it also has a like a mug on a pedestal. They had I don't know how many of those. So I said, you only need six of those. Then they said, no, 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 we don't need those. I said, we have a mug collection. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so I opened the next cabinet. They had every, all kinds of mugs. They had mugs from everywhere they had traveled, like beautiful pottery mugs. They had the, you know, pictures of themselves with their grandkids, world greatest granddad. They had so many mugs. And we took all the mugs out and we put them on the counter. And we said, you're keeping all your mugs. But I could see that there were a lot of those ugly mugs that you get when, from a promotion you know, when people used to give out mugs, you know, for the insurance company and what, like, there were just so many, like, random kind of mugs. And I said, what about all these? Oh, no, we don't care about those. We got rid of all of those mugs. We got rid of chipped mugs. So I said, I don't want you putting, you know, you put a chipped mug, you know what happens when you put a chipped mug into the microwave, right, and heat something up, that entire mug becomes, you know, like lava, right, because it has the chip. I said, we get rid of those, we get rid of those. And they ended up with a really decent inventory of mugs that were special to them. Right, the pot, nice, beautiful pottery mugs. The you know the mugs that still had photos of them, or you know great granddad, or whatever it was, and they were able to you know to keep them. And again, that's an example of you don't take the prescribed method of what works for you. We took an entire inventory of items, being their mugs, right, and we kept what they had room for it. So we said, you're keeping these. And they felt really accomplished and great. And they ended up with so much space in their kitchen. And I, all of that stuff was donated to Savers. I brought it all to Savers. When you think about beginning the process, so this is sort of the emotional functional scale, right? Take a list. And our right-sizing guide has this sheet in it. You list all of the items that have no emotion, paint cans, the junk drawer in the kitchen, I call the nightstand up you know, the bedroom is the junk drawer of the second floor, right? Because the same kind of junk that goes in the junk drawer in the kitchen goes to the junk drawer in the, in the nightstand. Plastic containers. How many of us still have all those black plastic containers from when, during the pandemic, during takeout? All those things that don't mean anything, but will make, will really help you make space, gain momentum to move forward. Say, I'm going to, have, I'm going to do this from now until March 31st. All those items, check them off. Apply the 80-20 rule, right? There's some, there may be some things that you get rid of entirely. Maybe you get rid of all the paint that you have in the basement. Maybe you get rid of all of those used, you know, plastic containers that have not seen the light of day since they were put in the cupboard, right? You can get rid of all of those. Or if you're taking a look at things like serving platters, after the holidays is a perfect time to look at that stuff because you've entertained. And did I use any of that? Right? Did I use all these platters? No, I didn't, but I did use these. Right? So you take a look at all the platters and then get rid of the ones that you don't need. And then as, soon as, as, as you start gaining momentum, maybe it's then going from March 31st to April 30th, clothing. Clothing's a really good place to start, especially after a season. So you do that starting in April. You're taking a look at, what did I wear all winter? So let me collect all of my winter clothes. 
right? The entire inventory of jackets, then the entire inventory of sweaters, boots, heavy socks, gloves, scarves, all of those things. Did I use them this winter at all? It's a great way to answer the question of what should I get rid of it? And if you didn't use it this winter, very likely you're not going to use it next winter. You're certainly not going to use it from April until, you know, next uh, November. If books are a thing, and so many people have a thing for books. If you're a book person, you are a book person. And you have all kinds of books, cookbooks, reference books, novels, history books. You have everything. You may, you have been, may, may have been a teacher. You have math books, his, whatever. Books are really, really difficult if you're a book person. And I never say to someone, start here with books. Because you know what happens. <laughs> you get to Kill a Mockingbird, your favorite book, right? Page 164, they're, the, they're in the courtroom. And you sit down, you finish reading the whole book. You haven't touched another book. So don't start with books, but take a, your first stab at books, right? Take your first stab at books that you know you will ne- probably won't read again. We all have these um, travel books that we got, or atlases, that probably are, that could be anything from 10, 20, 30 years old. Those are great to get rid of, right? The, the things that you know you're not gonna touch. Some people think, oh, I need that information. I was talking to this one earlier about, like, she said, you have an, I was looking up the meaning of Year of the Dragon, um, which will be celebrated here tomorrow. And I, I, I said, oh, I'll look it up and find out. She said, you have an encyclopedia in your hands. And you really do, right? You have your phone. We have computers and tablets. There's so much information. So can some of the reference books that you do have, can those be getting rid of? But if you are an, um, a history buff, or you love non, you know, um, nonfiction, you love a certain author, what, who, whatever. you like a certain genre of books, you like um, you know, um, murder mysteries, don't start with those. Get rid of all the other things. You may be surprised, you may have room to keep everything, else, everything that you like and need and want once you get rid of the stuff that you don't need. But if you do end up and still think, I still should go through these, do you have duplicates of books? You know, do you have books that you probably won't read again? Ask family or friends. Or a really great thing with a book is to say, this was my favorite book for years. I think you'd really love this story. Write them a note and give it to a friend or a family member. And then that's when you can really, at the very end, you've gained so much momentum. You've cleaned out so much by dealing with things in manageable bites that have low emotion you sort of charged up, right? The stuff that has a lot of emotion is when you start dealing with uh, my grandmother's china, my mother's china, my hummels, my yadros, the things that I know don't have a ton of value, but I have to deal with them and get rid of them. But with that comes, oh, I got this one from my you know, 40th wedding anniversary. You know, I got this set of china at my wedding. All of those things, again, you may not want them or use them, but it will bring you down an emotional hole. So deal with all that stuff. You know what that is in your life and in your house. Deal with that stuff at the end. Don't try to deal with it at the beginning because it won't get dealt with, but just don't try to deal with it at the beginning. Sure. What kind of pictures, like paintings or child, like pictures of kids, kids. photographs? Like prints, paintings, the prints. Donation is the best. It depends, right? We'll talk about donation. You don't want to donate anything until you know what its value is, right? Um, but prints are huge in terms of donation because they, they can be reused. There are lots of people that do arts and crafts with prints, especially if it's a, even if it's a fake oil painting. They take it and they repurpose it and, oil and you, know, re, you know, take the painting and paint over it. Frames. Right? They take, they'll donate that and they'll, people will take the fr- keep the frame and the glass for another piece. Because it's so much cheaper to use a, an old, paint an old frame than it is to go get something framed. So that's, and, and we donate a lot of um, artwork. As long as it's not, like I said, as long as, it's not, as long as it's not valuable. This is an example of what I was saying that very first month 
dealing with things that have no emotion. If you were to do that and then apply the 80-20 rule to the inventory of plasticware, pots and pans, you would have made some progress. You may not be, have zero, but you would have made some progress. And when you're on a right-sizing cycle, say every six months I'm going to do this, you then go back and start again. You know, next year maybe. You go back and you go back to that plastic wear. I thought last year when I did this, I was going to use this set of Tupperware that I got in 1975. Right? I haven't used it. So think about as the cycle goes, as the time goes, whatever you put yourself on, say, let me see if I'm going to use that in three months, six months. And then if you don't, it's a perfect time to donate it. There are some very harsh realities. I hit on, the, uh, on them a little bit today. Uh, realities of right-sizing. Family or friends don't want anything you have. They may want something that you don't think they want. That's why you need to ask them. Oh, sure. Thomas Joe, I wouldn't chime in, but I have to. Because this is about the point of your family may not what you... Well, the family may... Okay. Thank you. I'll try to stay put. That's hard for me to do. I have to briefly tell you my grandmother's story. Because your family members, as Joe said, probably don't want what you think they want. <laughs> However... Did I tell this story last time? Yeah. I did. Okay. Yeah. All right. There's a few new ones. I'll keep it quick because it's so near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm glad I told it last time. Sometimes I forget to tell it. My grandmother, my dear grandmother, she was my person. She was the person that was closest to me. She passed away my senior year in college. And when I came back to help my family, my, my aunts and my father were going through her belongings. They were so um, proud to give me her wedding ring which obviously was very important. I wear it often, I didn't wear it today. Um, but I said, where are her plastic bangle bracelets? She had these enamel, you remember from the 60s, those enamel thick plastic bangle bracelets that she, she had them in every color, every width. And I can to this day hear the sound of her bangles when she would brush my hair or do the dishes, just that noise of her bracelets. And they looked at me like, what bracelets? I said, the plastic bangles. And they said, you wanted that junk? We threw it out. And I'll tell you to this day, I would probably be wearing those bangles in her honor. But I was never asked by anyone or my grandmother when she was alive, like, here, honey, in my home, what are you connected with? She also had a uh, candy dish. It was not sterling silver. It has no resale value. But she had this plated silver candy dish that always had peanut M&Ms. <laughs> to this day, that's the only candy I eat is peanut M&Ms. And you bet your britches I would have kept that candy dish. But it was tossed because it was considered junk. So back to Joe's point, you never know what people are connected to in your home. Although I do use her china and her silver for all of my holidays. So you may have a grandchild out there that will use your china and silver, or not. That's right. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, it's back to the, the Aaron's, brace, Aaron's grandmother's bracelets and John's mother's golden eagle, right? You never know. Yeah. People think that this is this beautiful bedroom set. This bedroom set doesn't have a scratch on it. It's heavy. I need five people to move the nightstand. There's got to be a market for it. I bought it at Pain, uh, Pain, Pain House, and it's, it was $1,000 back then. It's perfect. It's got to be a market. I'm sorry to say that baby boomers did the same thing, and they're all in the same phase of life right now. The market is oversaturated with used furniture. Unless it's a mid-century modern piece, Haywood Wakefield piece, or um, a stickly, you know, original, there's very little market for used furniture. And if there is a price, I mean, is a, um, a market for anything, whether it be furniture or Hummels, Yardros, the sale price will fall way below what your expectation is. We do have a, a gentleman who goes out and he'll buy entire collections of uh, clients Hummels, he'll pay like three dollars for each Hummel. That gives you know that makes the client feel good. We we've known by looking at the bottom 
we know which ones have any have value and there are very few that have any value. Um, the client still feels great to sell it for three dollars because he brings it to his antique market and sells them for eight. Right. So someone else is buying. Them. He's buying them because someone wants them. Um, but it's much you feel so much better than having to throw them away. Brown furniture, that bedroom set that you bought 50 years ago. Again, there's not a market for brown furniture, but it's really, you know, still has a lot of life left in it because they don't build it like they used to. You know, now, now people that are starting in their homes, they go to Crate and Barrel, Wayfair, they get something that they know in five or 10 years, they're going to replace, you know, if it lasts for even five, you know, five years, right? So they don't spend the kind of money that we and you used to spend on furniture because they want disposable redo. They want to stay current. They're not going to buy that oriental rug that you bought that's in your dining room that has been there for 50 years. They're going to buy a rug for $239 at home goods that they can change out in six months, right? So there are, though, so many people that can benefit from your furniture still. We work with a great organization called Household Goods in Acton, um, but there are so many others. There's New Life in, in Walpole. Um, there's Project Home Again up in Andover. There's so many great places. And we had the pleasure of visiting Home, um, Household Goods. And what they do is they take everything, including mattresses, and very few people take mattresses, but they'll take mattresses as long as they're clean. Um, and they have a volunteer staff of about 900 people, and they organize it by room, living room, dining room, kitchen, bedroom. And they then have volunteers will take those who are in need of furniture items. Couple comes in, they have two kids. Family of four, you get to have a table, a couch, a chair, um, a bed, a nice, whatever. So they have an inventory of it. And we watched family, a family come in and literally sit down at this, in this room full of used kitchen tables sit down and pick out which table they were going to take. So the same with the bedrooms, right? And I always say a brown bedroom set is better than no bedroom set. So it is really best given a new life. And the other thing that they do is they will take household items, dishware, small appliances, and they, there's no limit to what they can take because they get so much of that. And then they can go in and take as many dishes and casserole dishes and toaster ovens. They can take as many as they want or as much as they want. So it's really good to, to, to know that items are really given a new purpose. Not everyone is out there going to Home Goods buying rugs for $239. They may not be able to afford to put food on the table. So they're going to be very grateful to have a free rug and, and perhaps a free bedroom set. Oh, I want to go back to... Knowing the value of what you have, right? To your point about, you know, art that's in your home. If you know, if you think, you have an inkling that that piece is worth something because it was your mother's and she, it was her mother's and it's been in the family for years, you think it may have some value, we're not going to sell it or donate it until we know it has value. And the beauty of our encyclopedia in our hands, I love that expression, I'm going to be using it now, is that we can find out from that, take a very initial look at it. There's a, um, a tool in Google called Google Lens, and you can use Google Lens. It will go out to the internet and find that same item or a similar item. But if it is a piece of art, we will bring in an expert to say, this is, you know, this is the art that they're interested in. He will either you know, appraise it, or if it's worth something and he thinks there's a market for it and you want to get rid of it, you know, potentially buy it. So it's really important to know the value of whatever it is you are going to donate or sell. Yes? Is there a market? It really depends. It's a good question. I mean, period antiques, yes. So something from the 17th, maybe, you know, 17th, 18th, 1800s, there is um, not the reproduction stuff. So not something that was from 1920 which is a replica, a beautiful replica of a Governor Winthrop desk, an original Governor Winthrop desk, yes. And um, we work with a guy who brings a lot of the stuff down south because there is a huge market for it in Arkansas, the Carolinas, because if you look at Southern Charm magazine, 
They are, when you look at how they've set up their rooms, all of the rooms have brown furniture in them. So they're, you, they use it in a very different way than us up here. So there is a market for like a true antique. If it's, we, you know, if, and we have, you know, experts who are able to tell us that. Um, and you, there is a market for, a, you know, 18th century desk, 18th century high boy, right? There's not a market for a, you know, circa 1945 high boy, right? So there is a market. We just need to, you just need to know, number one, is it the kind of thing that there's a market for and who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna buy it or take it? Yeah. Um, yes. Good, good question. We're going to talk about that. The next thing is we're going to talk about how do you deal with all the stuff. Um, but I just, it's so important, even when you're donating something, it's so important to know what it, its value is. And sometimes you are better off donating something and taking a write-off, and you always have to talk to your tax advisor and, and, and um, uh, accountant about, you know, how much can I write off. You're sometimes better off to write off a sofa based on the Salvation Army or the IRS guidelines of, you know, $500 can be used to write off a sofa. Someone wants to give you $20 for it. So it's sometimes you're much better off donating than you are you're trying to sell. So we've talked about how do you go about this, right? What do you do with everything that you're stuck with? And there, there are lots of resources available. I think, you know, professionals, um, like move managers and professional organizers. Um, it's really important if you are gonna use a third party that you have a certified move manager through the National Association of Senior and Specialty Move Managers or a, uh, a certified organizer through uh, the National Associ Association of Professional Organizers. We've all gone through an extensive um, course uh, catalog of ethics, we know the industry, we know how to get rid of things, and we have a network of vendors that can be of service. So it's really important if you can engage uh, professionals. And they'll also help manage the process, which sometimes can be incredibly daunting. There are appraisers, auctioneers, estate sellers, and consignment stores. So we see far less of this than we used to. So appraisers we see all the time, and we have a, a wide range of appraisers based on what it is that they, uh, what it is that you want. We're not going to send, uh, if a guy specializes in antique tools, we're not going to send him to look at your, your china. But appraisers still exist, and sometimes it's really helpful for estate planning to have a, a formal appraisal um, done by a certified appraiser, so that licensed appraiser, so that you have that information. Auctioneers, um, some auctioneers are really great. They will come in and sort of pick what it is they want to take for their auction. You have to remember, they're go they want to make money on that. And they always start at auction. An, an item starts at a low price. They're not going to give you as much as it may be worth. So you always have to know what it's worth before an auctioneer comes, because they're going to go right to the thing that they know is going to bring them a high return. So you always have to know before you bring an auctioneer in what is the value of all the things that you have. Estate sellers, we don't see as many estate sales as we used to. Um, it really started in the pandemic, but it also started with the saturation of the market with so much similar inventory, furniture, china, and all those things. But there are some good online resources that we'll talk about in a second. There are also some really great brick and mortar consignment stores um, in you know, Newton and Wellesley. I believe there is, there's a woman's there's some you know, high-end women's clothing consignment. There are furniture consignment stores. There's a lot of great consignment stores, and it's well worth knowing who's in your area that will take things. Of course, you, there's always a split. It's either 50-50 or 70-30, 70% to you, 30% to the consigner. Um, and they keep it for a certain period of time, mark it down a couple of times, and then you know, donate it if it's, return it to you or donate it if it's not sold. But it's really important to use the appraisers for helping you determine the value. But it's really helpful to have um, the auctioneers and estate sale folks help with executing the sale. Again, um, there are so many great online resources now that we don't see as much of the live auctions and estate sales that we used to. 
So online resources, consignment that's online, um, we work with a company called The Real Real, um, and they have a pretty high-end inventory of items that range from very little home decor, but Chanel, um, Versace, very, you know, original vintage designer items. They will look at um, jewelry, Cartier jewelry. They'll look at watches. And they literally will come in. We've had them come to the home and take a bunch of items, and then they put them on. They, their experts price them, and then they put them online, and they're not auctioned. They're, this, they're, they're designated a specific price, and then that, you know, they, they, they've been purchased, and then there's a 70-30 split. We also use um, Furniture Consignment Gallery. I don't know if you know, there's one in, I think there's, there's one in Hanover. There's one on Route 9. And then there's one um, in Burlington. But Furniture Consignment Gallery will take nice furniture. Um, and I always look at the site and see what they're carrying to give me an indication of whether or not there would be an interest. So they'll take furniture. They'll come pick it up. They'll take furniture. And they will um, display it both online and in any one of their stores. Uh, and then they sell it. And there's a 70-30 split. Um, but on the online consignment, like the Real Real and this Poshmark, and there's a couple of, uh, of, of lower, uh, ends as, lower end as well, if you're willing and you want to go through that effort, it can be worth doing. Um, you know, it's, it's having to deal with packing up the items, finding out first if they're interested. Online, you can take a photo, right, submit it online through their website, and they'll tell you whether or not there's an interest in the specific item. And then they either pay, send you something to send it in or whatever, and, and then you ship it out. We do a lot with online auctions. Um, who's heard of Auction Ninja or Max Sold? So you'll know Auction Ninja is really a, um, an engine that's behind people who want to be online auctioneers. So we use a company as an example called Bird's Nest Auctions. And she uses the Auction Ninja online tool present her, her, uh, her items. So how that works is that she'll always, the auctioneer will come in and look at what you have and see if it has a mark, if there's going to be a market. Does she think that it's going to bring in X amount of dollars? Um, and then they work on, we work with them sometimes, they then work on staging the items, inventorying them, photographing them, and then putting them online. Um, they all start at a dollar. Every piece starts at a dollar, and it's surprising to watch these auctions as they go where, you know, you see it first day it goes to $10, you know, then you keep watching it, and then um, it goes to 50 and then it's, you know, $1,000 by the time, and that's when I get suspicious of, did we let, did, this should probably not have gone to auction, we probably should have, you know, found another sale for it. So that's why we always, we always go through a, a level of, Get the appraiser in, let them see the highest end buyer, let them see what they would buy. And if they think something is of value, if that's the case, we're not going to send that to auction, right? Um, but clients have made out very well in online auctions. So the auction goes for 10 days. Um, there's no, with the auction ninja client uh, auctions, there's no setup fee, which is great. And there's a 50 50 split, and they coordinate the pickup at your house. So they don't advertise the address until the day of. And they say, you, 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 know, you're, you bought that bedroom set. You come Saturday morning between 10 and 10.30. And someone comes and takes it away, and they get paid, and they, they pay you. So online auctions, are, you, they're really growing in popularity and a really great resource if you have a really nice collection of different things. It's really a great way to, um, to get some money for some of your things. And then Max Sold is very similar. Except Max Sold is not sort of a franchise, it's just one company. And Max Sold can be expensive to set up. It's, I think they charge like $1,000 to set up the auction, and then you pay them for, um, you know, for selling uh, each individual piece. Donation centers, um, <laughs> savers. Um, I like savers because it's incredibly convenient, right? It's a good way to get a box, put it in your kitchen, put it in the garage. And when you find something that, you know, well, why don't I have this? I don't need it. You put it in that box. When that box is full, you go buy savers or you go buy Goodwill, you drop it off. 
And I always challenge clients to go home today, stand in front of your kitchen sink and open up the cabinet either to the right or to the left, go to the top shelf, take something down. That's the first item that's probably going to go in your box. Mm -hmm. The last time I did this presentation, I was like, I was in the shower thinking, you know something, I'm going to go do that. I've never done it. I went to the kitchen, and to the right-hand side of the cabinet was this box of coffee, nudge coffee bombs. I have no idea what they are. I have no idea where they came from. And you know what's on that top shelf? The dog's medicine. Dog's flea and tick medicine. <laughs> like, why? So I don't, this is going, it goes in my bag because I always want to show it now. But when you, you will pick up something and you'll say, why do I have it? If you ask, why do I have it? It goes in that box. And again, that's such a great way to fuel yourself to sort of keep going. But anyway, so Savers is a great place. They do, they, not all the money goes to, to um, uh, nonprofits because they have to pay for the brick and mortar, they pay for staff. But I think the convenience, it's well worth it, right? It's well worth being able to go there, drop things off, and know that part of that is going to be, you know, used for good. There are nonprofits like Goodwill, um, Threaded um, in Newton, which is a really amazing organization. They use the proceeds for, from the sale of women's clothing to provide scholarships to um, inner city students. So they're right in Newton. So they will take, and they have a full list of the kinds of items that they'll take. And they'll either pick it up or you can drop it off. Um, and then, you know, Habitat for Humanity is a really great organization as well. Um, either they'll take tools and the kinds of things that can be used in building, right? But they'll also take things for sale in their restore stores. The tech. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. um, and then donationtown.org is a really good resource. So if you go on donationtown.org and enter your zip code, it will give you a list of uh, organizations that will pick things up. And they will, <clears throat> excuse me, they will um, set up a time. Amer AMVETS, American Veterans, Vietnam Vets, they're really great at it. And sometimes they'll even take things, like they'll take clothing, they'll take small pieces of furniture. You, I like it because you schedule a time. Tuesday at 9 a.m. it has to be out. You know then, by Tuesday at 9 a.m., I at least have to have a you know, green trash bag full of stuff for them to pick up. So it's a really good resource. It really, the resources really dwindled during the pandemic and over the last few years, it, we've really seen them increase. But that's a really great resource and a great way to just put it on your front steps for someone to pick up. We will talk about um, the recycling of, of textiles in a second. Um, I, I didn't want to think that I didn't forget that, but there's a whole terrific resource for that. Online resources, um, buy nothing is a website that you can become a member of and you can post things and people will just come and take them. Facebook has both community pages, like Buy Nothing community pages. So Buy Nothing is an organization that you pay into to give stuff away, which is good. But Buy Nothing, so if you go on a Wellesley Facebook page or Wel Wellesley community Facebook page or a Wellesley Buy Nothing page, I guarantee you probably have one. And you just post an item, dish, you know, set of China, please let me know if you're interested. Someone can come back and say, I'm interested. Contact them, you tell them, here's my address. You put it out on the porch, they come pick it up. So that's a really good way to sort of get rid of things. Yes? Exactly. So th that's why I say you put it on the porch and leave it for them to pick up, right? If you ever do, if you're going to do that and they have to come in the house and do it, Never, be, never do it alone or don't do it at all. And that's why I'm not a huge fan either of Facebook Marketplace, although it is, it, people can use it. There are so many scammers. That's, that's not, not even from the perspective of, of, I think it's dangerous to let people in your home, but we had a client who lost $3,000 from a scammer. For, he was trying to sell something on Facebook Marketplace. He ended up paying him $3,000. So you have to be really, really careful if you use those things. That's why I do like if you do a buy nothing and you drop it somewhere or you say or you meet them in the parking, you put it in your car and you meet, meet them at the parking lot of the police station. Right. We suggest that sometimes. Or if clients are going to do it, we'll be there with them. So we do do that. But we caution people 
there are risks to doing that. So it's not the number one sort of way to get rid of things, but never let, obviously never let people in your house. That's why the marketplace thing where you're, there's going to be a potential exchange of cash, I don't, I don't really care for that. Disposal companies, there are haulers. Um, you probably have heard of like 1-800-GOT-JUNK. We work with smaller um, disposal companies that have um, b- larger networks of folks that will, buy, will take things for donation. We do work with one hauler who has a network of buyers as well. So he has buyers for furniture, crystal, um, artwork, all kinds of things. And then he has great network, uh, a network of, uh, of folks for donation. When I talk about municipalities, I think it's probably one of the most overlooked and forgotten and most valuable resources. Wellesley, mass.gov, right? Wellesley, is, is your, what is in your backyard is a tremendous resource. Not only, you know, can you, you can, um, there are textile recycling days. Um, there's an organization called Helpsy, H-E-L-P-S-Y dot org. And you can, they will take um, clothing and um, they will either recycle it for textile or they donate it to third world countries. There is a yellow box. You may see them in, in gas stations or parking lots called Planet Aid. Planet Aid will take textiles, use textiles, so sweaters that have holes and those kinds of things. Linens, towels, animal shelters love that, love those. So that's a great place, you know, great place for those. But I think that there is, I looked at the Wellesley site yesterday. I was, and I look at every time I go to a specific community, I look, I was so impressed with what Wellesley has to offer in terms of resources, right? I loved that they have the recyclable of the month. Like th- this month, it's, pla- it's plastic um, bottles, and they tell you why, and they tell you how to get rid of them. Um, that's the best option for hazardous waste collection. And this is just an example. Of th- th- there, there is, you can see it, there's box, you, how, do you, how do you get rid of um, cardboard, brown paper bags, mixed office paper, mixed paper, electronics, um, glass, Rigid plastics, non-rigid plastic. There's just a way. They have a resource for everything. And they also, what I love too, is they have the reuse where you can share with the community. That's another way to get rid of things without, um, you know, having have someone come to your home. So I really encourage you to become familiar with what Wellesley has to offer in terms of helping you get rid of things. Um, we often see that clients, they overlook it. They say, oh, I'll have someone come and get it. But if, you know, you have your grandson or your neighbor come and take that dresser and you buy a, a sticker for it and put it on the t- curb, they'll pick it up, right? As opposed to paying someone to come and get it. Every time we say that to someone, right, we, they do that. And it, it's gone off the curb before the guy yeah. comes to pick it up. So they paid a $20 sticker. So you just have to know your neighborhood and know sort of what kind of traffic you get. But it's really important because I think there's so many options uh, through the town, especially for, the, uh, for reuse and, and, and also for the recycling of items, electronics, paper, and all that. I looked, they don't have a schedule published for 2024 yet. So like, when, it, when is the hazardous waste day? Is it in June? Um, I was interested, the, um, I always say to people, when people say, how do I get rid of paint? And I say, well, you know, latex paint, you open it up, you put kitty litter in it, kitty litter hardens, you can throw it in your regular trash. And then um, Wellesley Town Site shows that as well. They give, they give that as a, as a specific example or a tool. Yep. Yep. So it's really important to know what's available to you. It's, it's, it's surprising to me how people don't sort of take advantage of what their town offers them and how you can really get rid of stuff. So probably one of the best recycle, reuse sites I've seen, community sites I've seen. So how do you maintain this right size life? You go through this effort, right? You go through the effort of clearing out all the things that mean nothing to you. You clear out the, um, your books. How do you maintain that? Because you are going to continue to live. As I said, it's not a one once and done thing. It's a journey. Get yourself on a cycle. You know, say, I'm going to do this every six months. I'm going to do it after every season. 
I'm going to do it after every holiday. Doing it after every holiday is great because you really can focus on the things that you use, not only in terms of decor, but what did you use for platters and silver and glassware and all that stuff? Thoughtful shopping. Like, really, when you're thinking about shopping, um, don't try to, don't, you know, when you, when you think you need a little bit of cilantro for a recipe, make sure you check and make sure you have some cilantro that you didn't buy in 1996. Um, make sure that you go and, you know, be thoughtful about what it is you're going to buy. It's so hard sometimes to, you know, you make, I'm not good at it. You, you know, make a list. If you make a list, you're very thoughtful about what you're getting and you don't end up with, you know, three things of cilantro in the cupboard. Bulk buying, Costco, BJ, Sam's Club, probably the worst thing that happened to um, cupboards, right, in basements. Um, my mother used to say, she, we had eight kids in our family, she used to say, I really needed that when you were young, right? Um, when you go get, a, you know, 20 rolls of paper towels. So just limit that. If you have the space for it, great, because it's then, if you, you, then you don't have to be shopping so often. But don't get so much. I had a client once who used to go and buy cereal, and we noticed in the cupboard that they had cereal in plastic containers. And we go downstairs and they had all these Rubbermaid closets, you know, those stackable closets with doors. And they had cereal in the closets. And I said, do, now do you buy all your cereal in bulk? Oh yeah, we buy it all in bulk. They were not rotating the inventory. They had to put it in those plastic things in the cabinet because the boxes were too big in the, uh, to be put in the cabinet. And then they weren't, they were just co- like literally collecting it. And then some of it was really out of date. So you really have to be thoughtful and bulk buying is not helpful if you end up, you end up wasting. One thing in, one thing out. You're gonna stay current. You're gonna freshen up that, that sofa with some new pillows. You go buy new pillows, recycle the others, put them in that box and drop them off at Goodwill, right? Doesn't mean that you have to stop living and stop staying current, but don't, throw them in the, in the guest room closet. And touch it once. Go to your cupboard, pick that one thing. Why do I have it? Put it in a box. And then when that box is full, you can bring it off, bring it off to Savers or Goodwill. So as Aaron said, if you want the right sizing guide, please you know, send us, um, provide us with your email address. You can also email rightsizing at dovetailcompanies.com and we'll send it to you. And then if you, you know, want to reach out and ha- have an if- initial uh, conversation, initial uh, complimentary consultation, please feel free to. You can do that through the Right Sizing um, site, or you can do it by calling us at 227-1600, extension 704. And I'll leave my cards up here as well. So questions? I, I, I think that's great because it gives you, it's, it's because people never know where to start. That's why we say if you apply the 80-20 rule, if someone says get rid of one thing, you know, every day increase it by one, someone's telling you how much to get rid of. The only thing about that is you're not always going to attack the entire inventory of something, you know. But I think it's a good way to get started. And I think, Aaron, you had shared recently something where um, you take a, what is it, during... For a month or something, you, spring cleaning, you fill up a bag, one thing a day, for the next 30 days. Um, and then when that bag's full, same, drop off at Savers or Goodwill and donate it. So, take, Tiptoe if you must, but take the first step and then you build on your momentum. Talk about textile recycling. I did. You did, okay. So. Yeah. We can give you that. I'll give you that resource, resource yeah. Yep, the 80-20 rule, it, it, it can be applied really to anything. It means that 80% of the time, you're only using 20% of what you own. So it's very, it, 20% is a real, then a really good place to start. So to Joe's point, if you took every sweater that you own in your entire home and put it on your bed, by the way, this is how we advise you take that first step. Pick one thing, one inventory of something. That's your one thing this weekend. Put it all out there. If you can, look at all of your sweaters and be real with yourself. Maybe it's 50% of them you decide to keep. It might not be all the way down to 20%, but you just need 50% of 
All over. And then you just made progress in your, you know, um, right. all the rooms. Or did you do the pots and pans example? I didn't, but I did the sweater example where if you if you have sweaters in every closet of the house. You just made progress down. In every closet. Yeah. Really quick, I think it's important to say, Joe moved last year and he took all the pots and pans. You know the large, like, lobster pots? Oh, yeah. He put, the, put all the pots and pans and he noticed he had, like, five large pots. And he said, okay, I probably need to keep one, maybe two, but I don't need. Well, he had just made progress. He had one in the front hall closet, one in the basement, one in the garage, one in the kitchen. And by just dealing with the lobster pots, he oh, made yeah. progress. Instead of yeah. saying, let me clean up my closet, and then there's all types of inventory. Mm -hmm. Same with the books. You may find that your coffee table books and your menus you know, are stored in different places in your house. When you take that whole inventory of one item, you've just made progress in all of those areas where you store things. I think linens is a good example, too. When you open your bathroom linens, you're probably using the same towels over and over again. If you have another stack behind, you probably don't need those. Here. Yes. Is it too late to do that? No. It, it isn't. I think that she, she said that in how, if, I, if it's the end of the winter and I'm donating my winter clothing, is there any space, is there any place for them? The beauty, there is. Well, a couple things. One is donation centers will hold those things if they have the inventory and put them out at the right time. Planet Aid or Helpsy um, that uses for textile recycling or bringing it to um, you know, uh, third world countries, They'll take it, they'll take any they'll take anything. So put it you could put it in those yellow bins. I mean, if if it's a value, if it's a Chanel and you know a, you know an original and it's a you know winter jacket, likely you're probably not going to find someone to buy it right now, right? Unless it's in Australia. But you see what I'm saying? So it really does. If you're going to donate it, you can donate it at any time. They're not going to say they're not going to say no. You should get tax receipts. And then, yes, yeah, so, um, I, so this is I feel to mention. Professional, that's our job to make sure we get all of your tax receipts, but if you do it yourself. Yep. You so it's always it. important. So when you go to Savers, for example, and you drop something off, they're going to give you a receipt. They're not going to list everything that you had. It's really important. If we do it for a client, we give them the list. What you need to do is then take that home, write down the list. You can either go to the IRS website. There's a publication 561 that gives you a value of what could be used to write off. The easier though, the easier one, is salvationarmy.org, the, the tax guide. We actually have this document. We can email it to you if you're interested, right-sizing at dovetailcompanies.com. We have these resources if you need it. But example, they'll say, you know, a hardbound book, two dollars per book, or- Yeah, you know, like, it, like so, you know, sectional sofa, good condition, Five hundred dollars, medium condition, fair condition, you know, two fifty, you know, um, poor condition, one hundred dollars. So we'll give you some guidance, and that all has been reviewed by IRS. Again, whenever you do anything writing, you're writing anything off, you always want to check with your tax advisor. But it's really important to get receipts and just make sure you keep a record of them. Yes. Yes, records but, and instruments was the question. Records, yes. The thing that's interesting with records is they'll only take them if they're pristine. So the same, my same godmother, my only one godmother, who downsized her kitchen with the baking cups, she also had a collection of albums. And I brought them to a, a, a um, buy, record buyer. He went through, and it was, he was so helpful because he showed me under the magnifier why it wasn't worth anything. He said because it, it, all of the grooves weren't smooth, they had little nicks in them. So they can tell if something was never played or played very rarely or played on a um, turntable where the needle was replaced all the time. He ended up buying just a couple of record jackets because he had really good records that fit in them, but the jacket was worn out. I got like, I don't know, $4 or something. So, but kids are still, you know, kids. It's back. It's back. You can donate them. Yeah. They, will, they will take, uh, donation centers will take them. If you know that there's one that's in really incredible shape, you probably should see if it has a value. Musical instruments, it depends on the instrument. 
Sometimes you're better off donating them to churches, youth centers, um, schools. Um, if some, we're talking pianos, that's a whole nother ball of wax. Mm, pianos, pianos are, are tough. Very difficult. Um, Great. This is the great part. We have a team of 30 on our move management side of our business where these are the questions. Like Claire's like, hold on, there's a, a group in Sudbury that will, you know, refurbish your instruments. So anytime there's a unique specific thing, we're able to collaborate as a team and help get the resources. Um, I'm just yes. going to excuse myself okay. for a few minutes, but continue with the questions. Yes. Good question. So our fees, we charge $105 an hour per person per hour. Um, and s clients can select to have us come and spend, you know, would contract us for 10 hours of sorting and organizing. Um, and then it's everything. Sorting and organizing is 105. Packing, unpacking, if you're moving, packing, unpacking, settling you in is all 105. And it's all hourly based. But, and we al always provide a, an estimate once doing an initial visit. That's the important part, because people say 105 an hour, well, how many hours do I need? Your complimentary consultation is followed by a very detailed estimate for the project that you need help with. So we have, you could just be prog say, I really need help with my books or my clothes. So we'll create a detailed estimate for that job um, that you can choose to do as much or as little, or it could be for the whole house. I need help downsizing, I'm moving into a smaller condo, I need help with everything, and we'll do an estimate for the whole downsizing, packing, moving, unpacking, managing contents. So we would never ask anyone to agree to our services unless you've reviewed what the cost would be. So you're getting a detailed estimate before you choose to use our services. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. I have cards if anyone wants to take a card.